I don't, can't tell you how many phone calls I got today. <laughs> oh, yeah, let me think about that. <laughs> are you serious? And I'm like, text internally and people externally. is like, are you kidding? He's like, no, no, no. <laughs> it's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's good. That, that's, one, that's one of my favorite stories about HR related things and like never fire anybody on April 1st because it can be misunderstood. Um, we had to do that when, uh, when I worked at utility and the guy sat through, you know, the manager went through the whole thing and was like, is this an April Fool's joke? And I thought, oh, oh no, it is. It's April 1st. He's speaking there totally <laughs> punking him. Well, welcome to another Direct Connect. Very exciting one here. Not only are we recording on April Fool's Day, but it is not an April Fool's joke that we're welcoming Mike Alameda to the Archer team as our new SVP of Client Relations. So, Welcome, Mike. We're throwing yeah. you right off the, the deep oh, end here. Man. It's a pleasure to be here working with some strapping fellows in the, in the security, compliance, and resilience space. So appreciate you guys taking a chance on me. <laughs> chance or a sure thing, but either oh. way. Also joined by Brian Carr. Who is our, our top golf extraordinaire after last week? So, <laughs> hey, I didn't. He and I were vying for last place between yeah. the two bays. So, yeah, it's, it's like it's like me bowling. I need to make everybody else bowl left-handed so I have a chance. I think my takeaway from top golf is I hit it hard, but I no aim. So, yeah. nothing it's to say there, Brian. It's all about the of the play. game that you play, I'm not right? Touch that. Depending on what you play, depending on the score that you get. So, <laughs> so. I know we all went to Salt Lake to play Top Golf, but apparently there was a WEC event there as well, the Reliability and Security Workshop and the WICF Workshop, which personally, I think the WICF one for me is a little more interesting because I think from the, the WEC perspective, I know Brian and I have both been there, they're kind of at a spot there's not a ton to talk about, a few yeah. little things, but it's tough to fill a, a day and a half, two days of content when things are kind of uh, at kind of a norm stage instead of the storm. But, but the WICF piece is always interesting. So you do the breakouts, you get to hear what folks are doing. I know I was in the SIP breakout. Mikey went into the internal controls. Um, I think the SIP one, the big one, was SIP 14 adjacency. That's going to be a huge piece, but we'll have a whole separate one, Direct, uh, direct Connect, dedicated to that in the future. But what did you see here in the internal controls? Man, so the, I think the, the eye-opening thing for me, well, first of all, I'm going to say about the WICF. Uh, I think that the, the ability for people to get together, utilities to get together, that's where things happen because everyone's pretty transparent. But I think... What was really eye-opening for me is Ruchi, who was the moderator, asked a question. There's probably about 35 people in the room representing utilities, and she asked, how many of you have a, are starting or have an existing internal controls program? And six hands went up in the room. And I was just like, you got to be kidding me. I just, exactly. Yeah. Like, Ryan, your expression said it all. Yeah. And yeah. That, that, to me, is, is when, when you look at the direction the ERO is going, we all see it. They're all focusing on internal controls and the fact that they've been saying this for years since version 5 came out a couple years ago and a very small percentage of people actually are focusing on that. To me, number, it, it tells me two things. Number one, obviously there's a huge opportunity in the space, but number two, people aren't looking at internal controls as a maturation for, for robust programs in general. I mean, at the end of the day, when we, when we internal controls are part of risk management. I think there's such a myopic approach in the utility space to risk because they're only looking at it through the lens of whatever business unit they're in. But the reality is when you think about risk management as a subject, I don't care what kind of business you're in, risk management should always be tied to business outcomes and objectives. And then it trickles yeah. the way back. When you, you figure out what those risks are, then you as a, as a business leader say, okay, how do those risks impact me and my organization? And then once you develop those risks, you put it in a risk register, then you start to mature internal controls to reduce that risk profile. So at the end of the day, when people are asking you, well, why do you need money to do this? You can say, well, these internal controls will help solve your business objective. Today, that doesn't exist, and it's probably a bigger symptom or reason why there's such a lack of maturity in the power utility space as a whole. Yeah, I know uh, most of the things I hear on internal controls, like you're saying, they're just so focused in on the, the myopic on, it's really more of a compliance risk rather than the, the total business. I think even when you go back to kind of the intro of internal controls, I think when we were still at WEC, Brian, they were still talking about yeah. how do you control not being non-compliant? Not how do you, how do you manage controls to manage risk to the business? Uh, and I think that's one of the pieces that I see 
way too many people, not only in WEC, but across the ERO and even on the, the entity side and the compliance, really miss the forest for the trees because it's really easy to think, oh, this is my world, my world's compliance. Everything revolves around that. Um, and I know that's one of the things I like to make fun of certain business areas that might do technology and information that, that think the world revolves around them. Um, but it, we, we, can't, we gotta be careful about that. And it's easy for anybody to just fall into that. I know that was a piece that when I took over the security at Grant, that was kind of the mission. One of the things I would always say whenever I went into another department's meeting was, hey, I don't turn meters and I don't push electrons. So if your job isn't getting done and I'm part of that problem, then I am a problem. Um, and, and that was a big piece that we set the tone kind of in our security organization that we were a service enabler. Um, okay. Also, a piece of that was the risk. I had to look at not only not only the risk from a security perspective, but also start looking at what's the financial risk, what's the reputational risk. More than just what's the risk something bad happens in the security side, because it's just a small piece. Particularly when I started working with our risk management folks, and I had kind of a risk register I built up around security, and they said, oh, that's, that's great. Here's the little sliver of our pie that is. Here's everything else. It's tough to ma maintain that uh, that picture, especially when you're kind of the SME level and head down. I know, Brian, you don't have any experience with that, do you? No, no, we've ne never, nope, never been down, heads down in the trenches. No, it's well, it, it really is. And I was going to ask follow up, Mike, you know, to kind of comment when you when you have six people raise their hands. What would you what would you recommend? I mean, you, you take take a compliance SME, even a compliance manager, somebody who's in management. Again, their 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 vision and their view of things is very narrow compared to the large, you know, the rest of the organization. Let's say, so what would you recommend? Like, how how can we get those folks to a help their organization look at things holistically, but also for themselves? Like, hey, it's not just about compliance here; it's about the bigger picture. Like, what what do you recommend there? I'd like to hear your thoughts on that. It's like there's two two phrases or really two words I always think of when when you see organizations where there is sort of a silo in there it's communication and engagement if you truly want to understand how your organization functions you have to engage the leadership and you have to communicate with them and what I mean by that right. if there's obviously emerging threats let's just use security physical security as again as an example we see it being being experts in the security field and the landscape ourselves we see it all the time because we're immersed in organizations, we're immersed with clients, we're immersed in peer groups, so we get to see this stuff on a, on, a, on a pretty frequent basis. Whereas you have a single person who's got a single pane of glass in an organization, they're only looking at what they're getting through their single lens in an organization. You have to proactively reach out to your leaders and say, hey, listen, I'm working, I'm building a risk register. Can you help me understand, Mr. or Mrs. Leader, what's the next level up of, of information or risk I need to know. Nick, go back to our time in the military, in the military decision-making process. Every time we had a mission, we always knew what the commander intent was at least two to three levels up. It was important because how we went about accomplishing our missions, we at least had a sliver and a lens to understand the strategic objective that the senior leaders in our organization wanted. And it should it's no different here. If you understand the strategic vision of your senior leadership, then it's easier for, for you to understand how what you do in your lane impacts it. And honestly, Brian, the, the, to answer your question, the missing piece is understanding what makes your executives tick. What is the business objective that they're trying to solve? Once you know what that is, I think it becomes easier to translate what you're doing in your role and truly understanding how it impacts the bigger vision for the organization. Yeah, oh, spot on, I appreciate that. That's, uh, yeah, that's some, some pretty valuable insight there. So if anybody missed that, they need to rewind a little bit and listen to Mike <laughs> go through that again, because that was, that, was, that was gold right there. Uh, I think, you know, one of the other challenges, and, and Nick, we, you know, continue on the risk discussion, but just from an adoption, we, I think we did a uh, direct connect a couple, eh, I don't know, two, three weeks ago, I'm trying to remember when it was, but we talked about internal controls and kind of some of the, the challenges that have existed uh, since since the concept's been introduced and they try to implement it different ways. There's been a lot of struggles, which I think has affected adoption as well, but let's not dismiss the fact that the old saying is nobody's nobody's gotten a, a PNC for not having internal controls. Like there's there's not a stick there. And again, I'm you know, speaking candidly is a lot of organizations do take steps to develop that program, but there's not the 
mandatory and enforceable stick behind it like there is for the SIP standards. So I think that's part of it as well for the industry to, to really move, um, you know, if that's the right direction. Again, that was Direct Connector did a while ago. Is like, is, is it the right thing? And like, we'll talk a little more about, you know, controls versus compliance versus security. Um, it's it's just not quite there yet. So seeing six people out of, out of 36 in the room, let's say, like, I'm surprised at that, but the other part of me isn't, you know, there's, there's just very little appetite and due to what I think is a lot of misunderstandings over the last few years of how to do it and what it means. I've heard a lot of buzzwords around it. Internal controls are important. You got to do risk management. And then yeah. you ask, okay, can you define either one of those terms <laughs> and get somebody to define internal controls without saying controls or internal? Yeah. Or risk management without saying managing risk. Um, <laughs> it, it's really challenging. I, I've only ran across a handful of people that have. Um, but it, it's people to understand. And again, it comes back to kind of what, what we were saying earlier. You got to look at the big picture. You got to know that that intent, one, two, three layers above you. I kind of go back to one of the things my grandpa used to say when I was a kid was that the company's not making money, you can't get a paycheck. You got to take that kind of on that macro level. If you, whatever you're doing for the company isn't moving the needle, how long are they going to keep you around? Um, that, that's an important piece, and you have to be able to articulate that. I know probably two, three years ago, Brent and I did a presentation at GridSec, and then we, we actually recorded it. I don't know if, Mark, you can drop a link into it in here for us to the, uh, the five utility languages, kind of a, a high level, how do you talk to the different organizational types in a utility, whether it's finance, operations, legal, compliance, general kind of executives. You got to figure out what moves the needle for them, and then you got to explain the risk to them in that um, that language. Like for example, one of the ones I used a lot because I was in the CFO organization was annual loss expectancy and dollars. And from a security perspective, when I put that into a bar chart, uh, NERC compliance and FERC dam safety were my two lowest risk issues because we had really strong controls. Sure, there was the million dollars per incident per day, extremely unlikely. Flip side, because when I first got there, we had employees that were sharing, were split from a public facing lobby by a three foot tall counter. Our active shooter was through the roof. It was fifty to sixty thousand dollar annual loss expectancy, uh, which for that one is a, a high impact, low frequency. That's a, a ten million dollar incident once every fifty years was kind of where we we ballparked that. Uh, but taking that, putting that down into dollars and cents, and saying, okay, over the course of the year, of the 50 years it's going to take between these incidents, we can either sock away $50,000 or you can give me this $10,000 capital project one time. When I did that to my CFO, I got approval like that because I put it in a risk that he understood and it was a business decision then. At the end of the day, that's one of the things we've always kind of been, nobody's come right out and said it, but I think even when I was at DHS, there was the, the concern that companies were making a business decision, that, but that some of the uh, larger utilities had a, a line item for fines and wow. they would just take the fine and move on. Kind of like, like some people who drive 150 miles an hour down I-15 through Salt Lake in a Porsche or through uh, Utah in a Porsche. <laughs> they just accept some risk and they're ready to write that check. <laughs> and I think what you're, I think what you're, what you're highlighting there, Nick, that I really want people <clears throat> listeners to, to pick up on is what you've done is you've actually created a value and you assign that value to the control and you were able to correlate the value to the control yeah. in weighing the risk and because the value was there is easier for that executive to sign off on it because he understood the value he understood what he was getting and it was a dollars and cents conversation and it was easy for him to make the decision the, the other thing that I picked up on even as people raise their hand is and I think we've known this as a problem for over a decade in the industry is that with the introduction of compliance requirements, people are double-hatted. They're wearing multiple hats in an organization, and compliance is typically not their first job. But risk professionals, it's also not their first job, right? You typically see a lot of attorneys, legal folks that operate in that realm, but there's no dedicated risk management person, unless you're a, you're a multi-billion dollar organization that has the capacity to create a, a risk organization. And that was really obvious to me after the internal controls discussion. I had one of our existing clients today come up to me, she introduced herself to me, and said that it was a breath of fresh air to hear somebody else talking about risk the way that she learned it. And, and just exchanging pleasantries realized that was something that she's attempting to do. She's like, I have to build a strategy, I have to get people to understand where risk is at the upper echelons of my organization. 
and, and translate it to other business units so we can collaborate and develop creative solutions. But again, that's, that's one thing we'll all say. If you don't have a dedicated risk officer or risk organization, that's the value of bringing experts and consultants to your space because you've got decades worth of experience and in certain cases, if, you don't, if your organization doesn't have the capacity to bring a full-time role, there is so much value in investing quality time and dollars with the right partner to help you communicate. Because at the end of the day, those things that you're trying to accomplish, those, those projects, those internal controls you want to build, if you don't know how to communicate it to your organization, it would make sense to outsource it because you'll wind up getting what you want and you'll wind up getting it presented in a way that's meaningful to the upper end and the lower end of an organization. Yeah, that communication, is, it can be so challenging, especially when you sit down, where do you start to eat the elephant with, with, with risk? Um, that's right. I know for me, it was one of those things where I was sitting down, I was tired of beating my head against a wall. It was like five o'clock at night. It was like, I can go home or I can take a little bit of the calm right now and start to put pen to paper on this. Um, and that's just where I started was, all right, let's just go ahead and let's, I was tired of hearing as a security manager, I was tired of hearing about how scary SIP was because I had just come from being a SIP auditor. For me, SIP wasn't scary at all. An, an active shooter in one of our lobbies was very scary to me. So how do I articulate that? And that's really where I started was just, okay, let's go back to the, the lessons you learned in my CPP boot camp and CISSP of how do you justify security? Um, and that, that annual loss expectancy is a really basic, but it's a good spot to start. That didn't really work when I sat down with the lawyer who didn't care as much. He was very concerned about reputation. I had to pivot a little bit, but once you've had that experience, it helps. And then having uh, friends and, and resources you can reach out to, I know it was a big piece of it for me, was kind of pinging around back then the physical security work group in WEC. What else has worked? Um, that was huge. Um, actually, it was, we actually brought in a couple different consultants over the years to help out with when things were kind of stuck, that was a good time when I would bring somebody in, whether it was uh, one of the guys that used to be in the space, uh, level four protection that did a lot of the damn uh, safety and active shooter. Um, mm. Brought in Archer to do a C2M2 when our executives were absolutely frozen on cyber, so. Yeah, that was fun. Fun, is that the, <laughs> is that what we're calling it now? <laughs> well, it's sitting in a room, but the, the best part of the C2M2 was the myriad of answers you get to the same question, right? Because you have quite a few different folks with different perspectives and uh, trying to get down to the, you know, the real true answer when <laughs> everybody wants wants to plug it in their way. And it's like, well, it needs to be like this. So yeah, it was it was fun, but. So um, there, was no, there was no donut on the C2M2 for that risk, uh, but no, trust me, that risk got flagged up real quick. <laughs> we have four different organizations that touch this and they'll have four different ideas yeah. of where we're at and where we need to be. Yeah, that was one of those. As soon as you and Steve were in the parking lot, I was in the CFO, CFO's office going, hey, we got this problem right here. This yeah. is the problem. Everything else. Um, but it's something that I couldn't put my finger on being kind of the frog in the boiling pot, if you will. Mm. Yeah. Somebody external going, hey. Yeah. The, the, you know, people throw around the term alignment. Right. You know, and that, that was a, that was a good example of seeing where, you know, everybody thought they were marching to the same business objective, the same outcome, we're doing the same, but they, they really weren't. Um, it became very apparent then that things were not aligned amongst those business units. And that's, again, going through an exercise like that, I mean, that's, it's relatively easy thing to do, but uh, it also is very telling. So taking the time to do something like that is, is valuable. Throw one more question at you guys. Let's just put yourself kind of a, a situational question here. Imagine you're, uh, you're the compliance manager, or you're someone at a utility or a uh, or in critical infrastructure in general, and you've been told, I put, a, put together a risk management program or plan. Where are you gonna start? Well, Mike, you'd take this one, but I'll just take from what he'd said before is understanding those business objectives. Um, that's, you know, at least where, but, I, but Mike, you had some good things on that. I just wanted to key in on that. That was one thing you talked about outside already. Of, uh, outside of Rabbi Google, what's risk management? <laughs> <laughs> Right. All right, I wasn't going to go there. I'm like, Amazon, like, give me a, yeah. give me a book, Chat right? GPT, yeah. build yeah. risk program. That's right. <laughs> Some people will probably do that, and that's the sad part. But yeah, will. at the end of the day, yeah, yeah no, the, yeah. you're not kidding. I mean, again, it, it, it ask the right questions. It, it's okay to say, hey, I know nothing about risk management. So CCAT, I mean, first and foremost, if I don't know, I've got plenty of peers in the industry 
that I can reach out to uh, uh, on a whim, pick up the phone and call them and say, hey, I've got this. Tell me what you know about this, right? Who do you know that I should know? It's one of my, I love using that line when I work with people, especially in the sales industry, because you can make a lot of great connections. But ask the questions to your leaders. Get your leaders on a phone call. Don't be afraid to go two levels up. Schedule a meeting with your director or your vice president and say, listen, I want to make sure that I'm, that I'm serving the organization in, in a great way. Help me understand what's important to you. Like what, this is a great line. What keeps you up at night in your role? Ask them what keeps them up at night. That'll give you a glimpse into what's important to them and their, and their leadership capacity as it influences your company. If you can get them to start to reveal those pieces to you, the rest is simple. You either, either learn it, spend hours and hours and hours educating yourself on risk management, or outsource it to a, an expert who can take bits and pieces, ask, know how to ask you the right questions, and really develop a world-class risk management for your company. I'd say that kind of pivot off of that, the, the one thing that I did when I was new as a security side, I said, what do you want me to call you in the middle of the night for? There you go. That was yeah. a good way to get my, my GM and CEOs uh, to, really, to really dial that down. Because if you say what's important, be there for days. When yeah. I say, what do you want me to call you at 3 in the morning for? That list gets real short real quick. Yeah. Uh, and that helped me figure out kind of the next piece was the, the mission essential task list. Going back to military, what are the things I have to do to be successful? And if I can do those things, everything else is gravy. Um, and that's where you start to find those, that critical path or those key risks. That's where I always start with building the risk registers. Where's, what's the metal? What's the mission essential tasks? And then build off of that. Because if you can't tie it back to a mission essential task, the next question is why are you doing it? Bingo. Yep. But, Spot on. And that, and that's, that's some people figured that out about me and really didn't like when I started poking around if they were doing things that weren't necessarily in line. I, I was going to say that that's the question that nobody wants to have asked is what, why are you doing it then? Because, um, and, and honestly, I think there's a lot of hesitation even in the industry to ask those hard questions, right? Because, wow, am I going to, am I going to work myself out of a job or it's going to show yeah. that I'm not doing my job well enough? That's not, you know, not at all what it's about. But I, I've, I've sensed quite a bit of hesitancy for folks to, to, take on a task like that because they're worried about, you know, are all of the shortcomings of our organization or, my, or the approach that I developed or whatever it is, is that all going to be now have this light shined on it and I'm going to look bad? Um, it, it's entirely possible, but for the good of the organization, there, there's, there's those tough questions that need to be asked. And My response to that is, do you want to be the one who points that out or do you want to be the one on defense yeah. when it gets called yeah. out? Yeah, you want it to be found out versus, yeah. If you find out, you can find that next spot to be that creative destruction next step. Yeah. When you get told, that's a bad day. Yeah. That's I guess very, I guess the true. only the only silver silver lining here is for the other twenty nine people in the room that didn't raise their hand. They're not alone, right? There there are other people just like you who are in the same boat you are. If I were if I were those twenty nine people, I would have gotten the contact information of those six and said, "What are you doing? Help me understand. What can I do to help collaborate with you?" That, that would have been my first instinct. Go find, go seek those people out and become their friend. I think the other thing we see in the risk space is people get to, so wrapped up in trying to get it exactly right the first time. Oh, yeah. uh, good enough is a good spot to be. Because uh, yep. risk yeah. is, a, it's, there, there's some math behind it, but there's also a lot of, of art behind it as well and continuous improvement. Mm -hmm. you know, something Every time we went through that with my risk manager, we found something new, we got a little better. All right. Well, thanks for joining, guys. Any last thoughts on on risk, internal controls, Top Golf? <laughs> uh, for the, for the record, I have never been caught exceeding the posted speed limit in Utah. Just want to make that clear. <laughs> Contrary to Nick's accusations, I didn't name any names. <laughs> no need. I noticed you said caught and in Utah, so I'm just going to yes. leave those two. Uh, caveats is, those are, those are carefully selected those. carefully selected work uh, no no other comments for me just enjoy the discussion uh, mike enjoy your your insights in this i mean you you know you've been in the industry quite some time seen a lot uh, not to steal the line from farmers but yeah it's uh it's good to have you in your perspective here so appreciate it excited to get in the get in the dirt get in the foxhole with you guys and, and make stuff happen all right well thanks guys take care until next time all right. All right. See you. See you, everybody. Your support drives us forward. 
Don't forget to subscribe and enable notifications, ensuring you never miss out on valuable insights. When it comes to safeguarding your business, Archer is your trusted partner. Explore our robust solutions at archerint.com. Get in touch with an email or phone call and fortify your company's defenses. We value your input. Share your thoughts, questions, or topics you'd like us to cover, and tune in every other Wednesday for a brand new episode of Direct Connect.